Our next speaker is David Mayo. Uh, and David is connect currently a research specialist at the Computer Science and AI Lab here at MIT and at the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines, uh, where he is advised by Professor Boris Katz and Andre Barbu. Uh, and David will be presenting his work on characterizing the models of visual intelligence. Hi, I'm David. Uh, I'm actually now an incoming PhD student at MIT. Um, so I want us all to understand how good our object detector models are and how well they perform in the real world. Um, more specifically, maybe also how similar are they to brains and what part of the visual system have we been able to capture with what our models currently do? So these aren't idle questions because we really have to understand how good our models are in order to make progress in deploying safe systems and in using them in the real world. And at the same time, better understanding the relationship between brains and our models can really help in guiding future developments of our models and directions that maybe we should be moving in. So if you just look at raw performance on many of our benchmarks today, you think that computer vision is well on its way to being solved. Um, performance is really not that far away from human level. And in some very recent cases, it may even have surpassed people and many specific tasks even leaving us behind entirely. But let's take a look at this paradigm. So what we do is we take ImageNet images, we show them to our models, we show them to people, and what we're comparing is just the accuracy, the overall recognition performance on many images on objects. And we can see that these accuracy numbers are pretty similar and very human-like for ImageNet. When we run these things in the real world, and this is an example of running this over Mr. Bean movie, uh, we see that objects will blink in and out of existence. So between frames, we're losing them. There's many objects that are actually not being picked up at all. Uh, for example, there's uh, a bucket and some boats in here that are just not getting picked up, but are in the object detector set of classes. And we can see that there's a clear drop off in performance between what we'd expect from these ImageNet benchmarks and what's actually going on when we try to use our object recognition models. So to kind of, to try to address this and to quantify this generalization gap, my work has been on building a data set called ObjectNet. When we use ObjectNet, which is a set of images that were captured to look much more like the real visual world and to control for a set of specific visual features, um, we can see that in terms of overall accuracy, there's this large performance gap between what people are able to do and what our machines are currently able to do. So I'll play this quick clip, which is how we have collected our data set to give you an idea. Basically, we have thousands of mechanical trick workers on the internet that go through this um, system that I developed to capture images of objects in different locations, in different backgrounds, in different rotations, um, and these objects are all collected at their home and are naturalistic, uh, regular, everyday objects that you see. By controlling, by doing the scavenger hunt and starting with the labels first approach, we end up collecting a data set of images that looks very different from other computer vision data sets. Um, in particular, this is an example of ImageNet images for a weight, an exercise weight. These weights often occur on uh, sometimes white backgrounds, sometimes in the gym, often correlated with people and how they're being used. They're usually canonical perspectives and viewpoints, and they're taken for artistic purposes, um, which makes sense because these are images that are web scraped from Flickr. When we control for the rotation of objects, the viewpoint that they were imaged from, and the background that they were taken on, so these objects were taken in the bathroom, the kitchen, the family room, entirely unrelated to what object class it was, it becomes uh, a much more realistic looking data set of what weights might look like in your home or in the real world. And it becomes much harder for object recognition models. Here's another example. This is a bottle opener for ImageNet, usually seen highly correlated with bottles and people, as well as in canonical views, such as just sitting out on a table. And these are object net bottle openers, which are in all kinds of different viewpoints and rotations and uh, also have a lot more class variability and are generally much more like the real visual world. So 
as you could just see, there's a striking difference in even just a couple of classes there. This striking difference, controlling for just a few parameters, adds up to a large generalization gap. So previously, this uh, top one error curve, the light blue line on ImageNet, which in recent years, if we extend this x-axis out even further, has reached and maybe even surpassed human level performance, um, is much lower when we try to run this on our object net real world images with visual controls. And this is about a 40 to 45% drop that we've observed. Zooming in a little bit further, when we look at specific classes, actually there are many classes in the object net where these models are performing well and many where they're not performing well at all. And interestingly, here I've plotted these bar plots, each represents the accuracy of many models aggregated together. And interestingly, the models that the object classes where models were already doing well have actually been improved at significantly. So that's where a lot of the gains have been. And object classes where models never did well have seen very little performance improvement. And I've actually seen this trend as well across even more fine-grained categories like rotation and viewpoint. So uh, it's also very unpredictable what's making uh, object categories difficult or making them easy. So some random uh, uh, selection of some of the worst categories would be milk, a coffee French press, a bench, a dish rag. Um, and some of the easiest ones that are also difficult to explain are things like a plunger or a safety pin or a hair dryer. Uh, further work has built on ObjectNet recently. Um, a recent paper on measuring the robustness to natural distribution shifts uh, has run many, many models on top of uh, both ImageNet and ObjectNet and compared them. And here are the blue dot, uh, there's blue dots, there's some orange dots and there's some green dots. And uh, these dots represent some different classes of models. So we have vanilla models, we have some models that were trained for additional robustness. And then importantly, these green dots are models that were trained with massively more data. So overall, running many models, uh, there's still this large gen generalization gap between ImageNet performance and ObjectNet performance. And the few models that have actually managed to break this trend and have seen additional improvement on ObjectNet than what we just expect from their increase in ImageNet score are models that were trained with massively more data. Uh, but this data is on the order of hundreds of millions or even billions of images. And the relative improvement that you're getting for that massive increase in data set is fairly small. Um, so using ObjectNet, we can see that our models are far from human-like, but accuracy is really a, a fairly coarse metric. Everything in a model and even the brain um, has to go right in order to get to that final output answer. So we can instead look at uh, neuron recordings and try to compare those directly to the activations of our model. So to do this, um, my recent work has been on taking this data from the Allen Brain Institute. Um, and this is in collaboration with Colin Conwell from Harvard. Um, so my recent work has been on taking this data from the Allen Brain Institute, which includes calcium-2 imaging of individual mouse neurons for about 256 mice and 120 images. These images are passed the same ones to both models and to mouse brains. And then we take the activations from models and we take the neurons uh, from mouse brains. We then do a little bit of processing to dimensionality reduce our activations in the models and combine our neurons across the different mice. And then the question we want to answer is how predictive are these activations from our models of actual neuron response? And this is building on the work of brain score. Um, here, we're looking at a metric of just regressions of predictivity from uh, our model activations to neurons. And when we do that, uh, the first key result is that our trained models are much more brain-like than our entirely randomly initialized models. So here on the left are ImageNet models that have been trained. Each dot represents a different model. And on the y-axis, we have a R-squared score, so how predictive are our activations of the mouse brain neurons. 
And then we have also our entirely randomly initialized models. And the blue greenish lines here are showing the connection between the models that were the same model architecture that was randomly initialized versus the model architecture that was ImageNet trained. And in every case, our ImageNet models are actually becoming more brainless. But much like what we see with ObjectNet, we still have a long way to go before actually fully explaining what's going on inside of the brain. Another key result that we can get out of this, and it's difficult to see with accuracy, is suggestions as to how we can improve our models to make them more brain-like. So what we've seen by ranking uh, many models that we've run across these metrics is that models that have more layers is better correlated with having a high brain score and having a high mouse brain score. Also models that are narrower as opposed to wider and models that have fewer parameters score better and are more brain-like. Additionally, we found that our mouse brain score metric is highly correlated with primate brain score, um, showing that now we have another animal model and a set of more neurons that we can use to compare our deep learning models to brains. Um, particularly, we think it's interesting, we think that a lot of this accuracy could be accounted for by earlier processing, where the mouse brain is a bit more similar. So all of these metrics compare full models to full brains. But what if models aren't capturing everything that our ventral visual system does? It turns out that by masking the input, which is showing people images and then disrupting their processing with a visual mask afterwards, we can compare models against partial human brains. So by tuning how long you have to process the time, so how long you've seen an image, we can dial in how much processing your ventral visual system can do. Um, and of course, this isn't perfect, masking isn't perfect, uh, but because it doesn't fully interrupt all the visual processing of your brain, but the disruption will leave a signature in terms of a decrease in your accuracy or a specific error patterns that humans make when they're limited in time. And one exciting hypothesis we're interested in is that since our models are feed forward, do they better match humans that have been time limited? So if a human has only 150 milliseconds or so to process an image, that really leaves one time, leaves a limited amount of time and allows them to do about one pass through the ventral visual system. So to set up these kinds of experiments and look more closely at humans and compare them to our models, we've designed an experiment where first, our test subjects look at a fixation cross. This fixation cross is there, so that way the object that appears immediately afterwards requires no saccade for you to be able to recognize and is resized based on the subject's distance to the screen, so it's inside of their fovea field of view. Then an object appears, and then a backward mask or a mask after the image appears. And uh, what's important here is in red, we put the timing. So We've been running these experiments for about 60 milliseconds to 200 millisecond, 230 millisecond durations to see what happens when humans are time limited and they only have this feed forward processing to rely on to recognize objects. So these are very preliminary results and we've run this on uh, many of our lab members. And so far what we found is there seems to be a large discontinuity when we set this up as a binary choice problem. So there's a category A and a category B, and you're picking which of those two categories actually applies to the object that you just saw. That makes this dashed line here about 50% uh, random chance of guessing. And we've seen that we can create this discontinuity where at a certain time point, they're suddenly able to recognize objects. And if we go too fast, they're really not able to. Um, and we've zoomed in and focused some more experiments in this discontinuity region or they're first able to start doing object recognition processing. And we started to look at what are the error patterns that humans make. So we set up uh, this experiment with time limiting to that uh, short duration where they're able to recognize objects in a one out of 30 category task. Um, these are 30 categories selected from ImageNet. Um, they actually overlap with ObjectNet classes. Um, 
And these are the correct labels on our y-axis for those images. And these are the responses that we got back. And it's interesting to try to decipher what are some of these error patterns that are going on. A few examples are speakers are mistaken for microwave ovens. Uh, we think this is likely because of the square shape and often happens with interesting lightings. Uh, matches and candles become uh, often mistaken. And this could be because they saw something on fire or the brightness or general color. Um, also, there's maybe some shape errors with things with handles, which are things like ladles and frying pan. So we're really interested in zooming in and looking at now that we can control for different times, are the patterns different for different times? And potentially are feed forward humans a bit more like feed forward models? And can we maybe compare deeper models where we unroll a ResNet to deeper layers and see if the error patterns actually change as we use deeper models and compare that to people with additional amounts of processing time? We're also interested in, in human vision specifically, uh, trying to characterize these different discontinuities in accuracy. So there's certainly one here, um, but it's not clear how quickly this saturates. Um, and there's also a number of edge cases of interesting images, some that are very easy and some that require much more processing time. We're using ObjectNet for some of these experiments now, um, particularly because ObjectNet has so many difficult examples for humans to recognize um, and has some where you can stare at for a few seconds before you're finally able to put together what you actually saw. Um, and with that, um, we clearly need models that are more human-like and are robust to the real world. And to encourage that, we're actually announcing an object net competition. So this was developed by a great team uh, at MIT, as well as in collaboration with the team at IBM. And the competition is set up like this. So we want teams to come up with uh, better data sets they can use to train their models, better models that are able to actually generalize to the real world or other kinds of innovations and train those models on their own servers. They can then package these models up in Docker containers and submit them to us through eval AI. And with this system, models will remain entirely hidden. So we've collected a new 6,000 image uh, object net data set that has never been released before. Uh, looks just like object net, but was collected a bit more recently. Models can be submitted to our competition once per day inside of these Docker containers. And the evaluation will incur entirely on our side. That way the images remain hidden. Um, and we can also limit the frequency at which models are submitted, which will keep object net truly a test set and prevent people from being able to overfit and uh, use it for too much fine tuning. We've also created three different competition tracks. So we have the traditional one, which is what we report a lot of our results for, which is training a model entirely on ImageNet and then testing that on the 113 ObjectNet overlapping classes. But we've also have two tracks for training on any data set. So bring your own data and then evaluate that on either the 113 object net classes that overlap with image net if you're using those categories. Or you can also attempt to use our full object net set, which we actually have 313 categories of all kinds of different objects inside of a home. And with this, we're releasing some starter code in both PyTorch and in TensorFlow, where it's very easy once you've trained the model to stick in your model weights, to update the model description files and the data set transforms for however your model was trained, and then upload this to us and we'll evaluate and let you know how well your models are doing on uh, real world data sets. So this competition opens up uh, this coming Monday. Uh, it was announced recently on the IBM blog and it will end during CVTR June 21st. So this gives teams about six months to work on this problem. If you're interested in participating, please check out objectnet.dev and there'll be links to uh, code repositories and eval AI where you can read docs and learn about submitting 